I'm going to make sure that we are recording this program and <laughs> internally, and I promise that this will get posted online as soon as we can. Um, our, yeah, one of our board members just confirmed we're not live on Facebook because all of a sudden Facebook said you need to use a live video API that it has never sent me um, a notification about before the entire day we've been doing this. So, wow. cool. <laughs> So you know what that means? That means all of you attendees tonight are getting exclusive access to this program this evening. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> Donovan says, yes, um, we're all so special here tonight. That just made our jobs as hosts much, much easier because we only have to pay attention to one chat. Wonderful for us. <laughs> Again, my apologies to no one who can see this right now who was counting on watching this via Facebook Live. So, okay, well, onwards and upwards. <laughs> Shall we take it away for the evening, Agnes? Absolutely. And anyone else who's watching this later, at least you have extra time to make your cocktails. So, you know, I see a lot of positives here. <laughs> um, well, in that case, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the grand tour of the Sutra Collection. Um, my name is Agnes Paldotas. Tonight, I'm calling in from unceded Ohlone land of Yelamu, also known as modern day San Francisco. I am a first year of the SF State um, Museum Studies grad program, and I'm really excited to be here, um, joined with wonderful colleagues and faculty members. And we are so, so grateful for Western Neighborhoods Project for having us on your platform and in your community. Um, so tonight we will be exploring the history and the highlights of this Egyptian collection collected by Adolf Sutro, which is currently stewarded by the Global Museum at SF State. Um, after our brief introductions, we will be uh, traveling virtually to Sutro Heights in San Francisco with um, my friend, and colleague Lindsay Hansen, who um, will show us how to make our signature cocktails of the night. And um, there will also be alcoholic and non-alcoholic options. So everyone will find what they're looking for. After we have our drinks in hand, I mean, I already have mine, um, but you know, some, some of us had time to prepare. Um, then Professor Jimenez from the SF State uh, Global Museum and Museum Studies Department will guide us through a brief history of how this collection made its way to the university. And then um, my friend Rebecca here and I will do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the highlights of the collection. Um, but before we jump into all of that, a couple of housekeeping things, um, just because as we can see, Technology is our great friend. Um, so as you can see, we are doing a Zoom webinar. It's not a regular Zoom call. So if you haven't done these before, um, basically the ones that you can see on your screen right now, we are your panelists and all of you are listed, at, listed as attendees. So if you wanna chat with one another, make sure that you select panelists and attendees in the chat bar so that everyone can see what you are messaging. Um, and feel free to ask questions throughout the entire um, conversation and the entire tour. We will both be answering them as we go and then towards the end of the night as well. Um, at the end of the evening, we will also have a short demographic survey that we will pop in the chat. Um, if you could please take a couple of minutes to fill that out, please. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with nonprofit work, you know that we live on demographics. Um, not only does it show us a little bit more about who you are and what we can do to bring you content that you will enjoy, it will also show our funders who we are reaching, and that is invaluable. Um, so, are we ready to get started? Awesome. So first, let me welcome Christine Fogarty, who is the Associate Director of the Global Museum, who will tell us a little bit about the museum and the Museum Studies Program. Thank you, Agnes. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. 
Uh, I'm here to talk about the Global Museum. Um, the Global Museum is the research unit of the Museum Studies Program at SF State, and we're housed in the School of Art. The museum opened in 2018 and is located in the Fine Arts Building. So when you're on campus, this is what you're looking for on the left-hand side. Um, you'll find us to the right, just uh, of the, the main entrance there, and there's our doorway. Uh, and also you'll find the Fine Arts Gallery, which is very close by. Now, both um, sites offer free admission. So when we're open again to the public, we hope that you'll come to visit us on campus. Next slide. Our current exhibition is Climate Stories, which explores the effects of climate change upon indigenous communities around the globe, as well as our own SF State and Bay Area communities. Pre-COVID, we have a variety of public programs, such as film and lecture series, field trips for K through 12 classes, and tours and object research visits for university classes. Museum studies student, students and students from other majors take active roles in our day-to-day -day operations. Next slide. So SF State offers a Master of Arts program established in 1987, as well as an undergraduate minor program established in 2016. And our curriculum is interdisciplinary, which focuses on hands-on practical work while also balancing theory and professional development. Next slide. So our mission, these are the three tenets of our mission. Uh, the Global Museum wants to be a place of scholarship through original research by graduate students in museum studies. We also seek to be a place of stewardship. The Glo Global Museum stewards university collections, which you'll see in a moment. And we also want to be a place of community, to be that third meeting or leisure space for our campus community and with our community um, to collaborate with and present programs and exhibitions. Next slide. So while working remotely, we embarked on a virtual exhibition inspired by the Climate Stories show currently up and the Black Lives Matter movement. Clearly Polluted, the fight for environmental justice in the Bay Area examines how Black and POC communities have been disproportionately affected by environmental hazards. It includes an oral history component where we'll be reaching out to the community for their firsthand experiences. It's our first ever community curated project in line with our mission and vision for the museum as a platform for underrepresented audiences. So let us know if you're interested in participating in our oral history interviews. Next slide. So our collections, the museum stewards a permanent collection of objects from around the world. So here's a funerary boat from the ancient Egyptian collection dated at about three to 4,000 years ago. And as you may know, the core collection of roughly 700 objects, including two mummified individuals, um, was collected by Adolf Sutro and exhibited at his Museum of the World in the Sutro Baths. Next slide. We're also lucky to have objects from West Africa. So these here are a selection of reliquary figures, masks, textiles, and metalwork and sculpture just beyond what you see on the screen. All our contemporary pieces but from communities using traditional artisan techniques, hundreds and hundreds of years old. Next slide. We also have an extensive array of objects from Papua New Guinea. So this is an Aharo mask being prepared for display. Aharo masks represent animal or human spirits or totems important to a family or clan. Worn by a young man from a neighboring clan, the Aharo dances around the village as humorous warm-up entertainment for the more spiritual performance that would follow. Next slide. We also have featherworks and woven objects from the central Amazon. We kind of hit pretty much all parts of the globe here. Um, the middle crown, if you see, was used by Chief Rioni of the Kayopo people in the Amazon, who is a renowned tribal elder and environmental activist. Next slide. So while we're remote, you can visit our collections online at diva.sfsu.edu. DIVA is our digital archive collaboration with Academic Technology, where you can search and view global museum collections up close, including those from our recent exhibitions. Next slide. And there's so many ways to get involved with the Global Museum. We offer volunteer opportunities, academic internships, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, uh, professional development and networking, and of course, community engagement. If you're interested uh, to find out more, please email us at theglobalmuseum at sfsu.edu. So thank you so much for letting me share our museum with you. I'll hand it back to Agnes, our wonderful MC. Thanks.
Thank you, Christine. And just looking at those photos, I'm so beyond excited um, for whenever the campus will fully open up again, because as we could see, it was all students working with these incredible objects from all over the world. So it's, you know, fingers crossed that we'll get there as soon as we can. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Nicole and John for a minute to introduce the Western Neighborhoods Project. Well. Nicole, you're muted. Oh. I swear I've used a computer before tonight, um, despite all evidence to the contrary this evening. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Christine. Um, it's been a thrill working with all of you, just all the students from SF State, the staff at the Global Museum. Um, I, this has been a dream of mine for some time. I'm also a Gator. I'm an alumni 2008, so welcome all you Gators to our Western Neighborhoods Project home. And I know we have a lot of members with us tonight. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for supporting us. But for those who don't know us, WNP is a nonprofit that preserves, interprets, and shares the history of San Francisco's West Side. And we've been doing that since 1999. I've been executive director since last year when our co-founders, Woody Labounty and David Gallagher, who's with us tonight, handed me the reins and I couldn't be more honored by that. And we do tons of work. We have a podcast, we record videos, we create educational resources for students. We host rotating exhibitions, technically, if there's not a pandemic happening. Um, we lead history walks and lectures like this. We also have our own oral history program, which has been going uh, very well in, in, during the pandemic with our Zoom capabilities. Um, and all of this you can find on our website at outsidelands.org. And then, because we weren't busy enough with all of that, in 2014, we launched an auxiliary program called OpenSF History, which conserves and digitizes historical images that span all of San Francisco, not just the West Side. So currently we have a little bit over 52,000 of these images mapped and accessible online at opensfhistory.org, including the one that you're looking at right now, and of course others you'll see tonight. So I'm the only employee and we do all this work, which is a ton for a little community history nonprofit, but we're able to do that thanks in large part to dedicated volunteers like, drum roll please, John Martini, who is our second color commentator for the evening. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm one of the many volunteers that helps with the Western Neighborhoods uh, Project. It's sort of, uh, I bring personal history. I grew up in uh, San Francisco and uh, God helped me a uh, daily city and started volunteering after I retired about 20 years ago. Um, I also have a personal linkage to our topic tonight, um, the Sutro Baths. I'm a gray beard and I go back far enough. I was, uh, a regular visitor to Sutro's back in the 1950s and 60s before it closed down and uh, saw the Sutro collection of uh, Egyptian artifacts and mummified persons on display. And we won't get into Adolf Sutro. It's a wonderful but sidelined topic. But the man Adolf Sutro who collected all these and he put them on display, he called them a cabinet of curiosities. And he called him bric-a-brac. And he said the reason that he was displaying these things was instill awe and wonder and curiosity in coming generations. And I got to tell you, it did it for me. I remember as a kid looking in those uh, vitrines at the uh, stacked multiple coffins, at the mummified cats, at the incredibly uncomfortable looking headrests. And it probably helped get me started on my road to history. I, worked uh, as a National Park Ranger and as a National Park Service Museum curator for over 25 years. And after I retired, um, I'm now enjoying a great retirement as a historical consultant and writer and uh, volunteer, even in times of pandemic. It's amazing how much work I can do from home for Western Neighborhoods Project. Thank God for you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Being here. And I can't even begin to describe the hours I have spent on open SF history. 
most recently <laughs> researching for Clearly Polluted. Um, so thank you for all the work that you do. And um, moving on now that we have introduced ourselves, we are ready to hit the kitchen, I believe. Um, so our wonderful classmate, Lindsay Hansen, has made an incredible video showing all of you how to make these two cocktails, which I'll be screening in just a moment. So just give me a second to change screens here. And while she does that, um... I'll explain that we will be dropping links into uh, the chat so that you can follow along with your own recipe in front of you and you can download them as well. Um, hopefully there's no technical issues with that, but uh, um, I also hope you're ready for two very delicious drinks that are about to come, come into your living room. Can everyone see my shared screen? Awesome, all right. Take it away, Lindsay. Hello, I'm Lindsay Hansen, a grad student of the SFSU Museum Studies program. I'm gonna be making some cocktails with you in just a moment, but first I'd like to take you on a short tour. I'm joining you from Sutro Heights Park, which sits perched on cliffs above the Pacific Ocean in San Francisco. It is the former estate of Adolf Sutro, a German Jewish immigrant who came to the United States during the Prussian Rebellion with his family and landed in Baltimore. But when news of gold headed east, Sutro headed to San Francisco, where he stayed shortly selling tobacco and then left for Virginia City, Nevada, where gold and silver had been found. Sutro was a self-taught engineer and made a fortune designing the Sutro Tunnel in Virginia City. Because he would, on occasion, work the mines, he not only got big investors for the construction of his tunnel, but he also had the support of the miners. The tunnel successfully removed water from the silver mines. Sutro then took his fortune and headed back to San Francisco, where he invested in real estate, which included the Cliff House and the land surrounding it. Sutro built his home estate directly above the Cliff House, and he funded the Ferries and Cliff Railway for the public to visit his attractions by the sea. Sutro charged a dime to members of the public so that they could tour his estate in gardens. The entrance fee paid for a team of gardeners. He spent in excess of a million dollars to create an Italian-style garden with fountains, mazes, statues, and Victorian flower beds. Only a few remnants of Sutro's home and grounds still remain. The stone lions that sit here now were once at the base of a magnificent gateway. Here we have one of the few remaining statues, Diana, the Roman goddess of hunting, or Artemis in ancient Greece. And here's Diana in 1886. Here you can see where Sutro had a conservatory that was warm, humid, and filled with tropical plants. It was a coveted feature for wealthy Victorians, and certainly a nice respite from the chilly Pacific fog in San Francisco. Sutro sold postcards and stereoscopes to the public which featured his estate. Now it's time to make some cocktails. The first one is a non-alcoholic cocktail I invented called Clara's Punch, named after Adolf Sutro's youngest child. Let's just pretend we're in the temperance movement. So what you're gonna need is a cocktail shaker, a citrus squeezer, a knife, a shot glass. The standard glass shot glass is about 1.5 ounces. This one is about three quarters ounce. And then on the other side, we've got two ounces. If you're feeling frisky and you need a double. You want to have one, maybe two limes. Pineapple gum syrup. This is a local East Bay company and I got it on Clement Street at Healthy Spirits. Some pineapple juice. Sparkling water. Ice. And for garnish, a fresh pineapple. While you are getting your ingredients together, I will tell you about the cocktail that inspired this drink, the Pisco Punch. 
In the 1880s, the Bank Exchange Saloon, where the Transamerica Pyramid now stands, bar owner Duncan Nickel created and served the Pisco Punch, the ingredients of which he guarded feverishly. The Bank Exchange attracted writers, and for a time, Jack London and Ambrose Bierce lived and worked above the saloon. Mark Twain, who coincidentally had befriended Adolf Sutro in Virginia City, Nevada, was also a patron of the Bank Exchange and a fan of Pisco Punch. It is said that a Bank Exchange regular inspired the character of Tom Sawyer. But it was Rudyard Kipling who perhaps sang the highest praises of the cocktail in his book, From Sea to Sea, Letters of Travel, when he wrote, I had a theory, it is compounded of the shavings of cherubs' wings, the glory of a tropical dawn, the red clouds of sunset, and fragments of lost epics by dead masters. But in 1973, the California Historical Society unearthed a version of the original recipe and the secret ingredient, cocaine. So perhaps it wasn't the tropical fruit that made the Pisco Punch so memorable after all. Our version, on the other hand, is named after Clara Sutro, out of Sutro's youngest child. And while Twain and Kipling were tossing back Pisco Punches at the bank exchange, Clara was of an age where she might have enjoyed this variation of the punch, while taking in the sights at her father's museum in Nickelodeon. Sadly, the only newsworthy information about Clara's adult life is that she got a divorce. The scandal. So first you're going to want to put ice into your cocktail shaker. And I just brought a spoon, so it's going to take a while. Okay, that's enough ice. Next, you're going to want to slice your limes in half and juice them. The hand squeezers are better for this, but this one's prettier. And that's more important. So we've got about three quarters of an ounce. Raise your hand if you're making the cocktail. You can't, they're too busy making the cocktail. 1.5. Now you're gonna want one ounce of pineapple gum syrup. You can put a little less or a little more, depending on how sweet you like it. I don't like it too sweet, so I put a little less. Then you want two ounces of your pineapple juice. And for your finishing touch, you're going to cut your pineapple so you have a slice for the garnish. Should have brought a good knife. This was the most period appropriate, still anachronistic knife I could find. And it's not even my knife. You could barely cut through butter with this knife. Oh, this is a honking piece. <laughs> I'll tip the glass over. All right, get yourself a lovely little piece of pineapple. Oh, so cute. And put it on the edge of your glass. Oh, make a slice on the edge of your glass. And this is the most important part. Put your cocktail shaker lid on. I have made the mistake of making cocktails without the lid on. Don't make that mistake. Shake it really good. It's freezing. Okay. And then, screw the top. Ooh. Pour in there. Ooh, so nice. So nice. And then, 
you're going to top it with some sparkling water. Cheers. This next cocktail is named the Spirit of Ness Pepper Noob, and it's named after the mummified individual in the museum collection. So you're going to want your cocktail shaker, your ice, citrus squeezer, knife, one lemon, depending on your tastes, or if you're making one for a friend, your shot glass, the gin of your choosing, I really prefer this gin because they make it with honey. Honey, and this is local, and fresh thyme for garnish. While you are gathering your supplies for this boozy cocktail, I'll tell you a little bit about its inspiration. It's named after the mummified individual, Ness Pepper and Neb, that is currently maintained by the San Francisco State University's Global Museum. Ness, as he's affectionately called, was a priest who worked at the religious complex of Karnak and Thebes, modern-day Luxor. This cocktail recipe uses the flavors of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians used medicinal honey regularly. Honey was used for skin and eye wounds due to its antibacterial properties, so it acted as a sort of bandage and ointment. Bees were associated with royalty in ancient Egypt, and as early as 3500 BCE, the bee was the symbol of the king of Lower Egypt. Juniper berries, which are the predominant flavor of gin, were found in ancient Egypt. Although not indigenous, juniper berries have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs at multiple sites, including the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. The berries are thought to have been imported into Egypt from Greece. The Greeks record using juniper berries medicinally long before using them in food. Doctors in ancient Egypt used juniper berries as a laxative as far back as 1550 BCE. Let's hope our cocktail doesn't do that for you. Lemons are thought to have originated in China, North Burma, or India and exported to Persia, Iraq, and Egypt around 700 AD. Ancient Egyptians used lemons in the embalming process prior to mummification, frequently putting them in tombs with dates and figs. Thyme was used as an embalming herb by the ancient Egyptians and was thought to be a powerful aid to those making the passage into the next life. So we're going to slice. These are nice Meyer lemons, local. And if you so choose, you can slice one for garnish. And you're gonna squeeze your lovely lemon on your aesthetically pleasing citrus squeezer. Oh, you wanna add ice to your cocktail shaker. I'm gonna put our lemon juice in here. And then for the honey, you can either put it in just as is, or so should you choose, you can make honey simple syrup with equal parts hot water and honey. And then lastly, your gin. My preferred gin is Bar Hill. They make it in Vermont. It's made with honey. So delicious. But whatever gin you like. There is a local gin called St. George, if you prefer that. Mix in the gin. And then if you're feeling frisky, you can put in a sprig of thyme, if you so choose. Don't forget to put the lid on the shaker. Shake it up. Very nice. And we have our lovely lemon slice for garnish. Ooh. Pour it in the uranium glass. If this breaks, it will radiate us in a nice,
time sprig. Cheers. What? Amazing. I was missing out on all the chats, but I saw the little red flags popping up. Well done. You've seen it here first, everyone. We discovered Lindsay Hansen. <laughs> Brought to you by WNP first. <laughs> I mean, talk about production value, right? <laughs> yes, members of WNP know that our production value is not that great. So it's really stepping up the bar for us here. <laughs> oh, people are asking how much gin, um, and I think Frank is gonna pop the recipe card into the chat for us just to double check the gin amount. It's um, 1.5 ounces of gin, Laura. Or thank you for paying attention. <laughs> gin as you as can much handle, as right? you want. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, oh my goodness. Okay. I have to rebound from that. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay. And now I hope everyone is equipped with a great beverage in hand. Um, so now we're going to begin our tour. And as I mentioned first, we're going to hear from Professor Jimenez about how this collection made its way to our university and how students and faculty have been researching it. So good evening, Professor. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm so excited to share with you some of the history of the collection and, um, and to also uh, take you on this sort of virtual time traveling tour. Um, thank you, Agnes. My name is Professor Lisette Jimenez and I'm an assistant professor in museum studies at SS State. I'm also an Egyptologist and a museum professional. And so we're going to take you or I'm going to take you on a tour this evening that explores uh, the journey that this collection has taken through time and space. And as Associate Director of the Global Muse Museum, Christine Fogarty said, the mission of the Global Museum is to serve as a responsible steward of cultural heritage, to be a place of scholarship, to be a place for the community, to be a space where we can engage the community and to appreciate the power of diverse communities in a globally connected world. And the students of the Global Museum are stewards of the Egyptian collection, meaning that we are responsible for the ethical care, the study and the display of these objects. And the collection that we're gonna talk about today, the one that we steward is the Egyptian collection that was acquired by Adolf Sutro and consists of approximately 700 ancient Egyptian objects. And some of the most notable objects in the collection include elaborately decorated coffins, which you are going to be more, um, you know, become really well acquainted with by the end of tonight in this exclusive behind the scenes tour. But you might be wondering, you know, how did this collection arrive at SF State? You maybe kind of have an idea of how it came to San Francisco. Maybe you don't. So I'm going to try to, I am going to answer that question tonight. So let us dive into the history of its purchase and its transport to San Francisco. So as many of you already know, you know, Adolf Sutro is, is, um, is known for a lot of different things, you know, making his fortune by engineering the Sutro drainage tunnel in uh, 1859. He's also known for all of his real estate investments in San Francisco. He was the 24th mayor in San Francisco. He amassed a substantial collection of books, um, which, you know, John Martini has talked about, especially in the podcast that we did. Uh, recently on Sutra the Collector. And, you know, he founded the glass enclosed entertainment complex known as the Sutro Baths in um, 1896. But, you know, not that much is known about the objects that he collected throughout his travels that would eventually be put on display in the Sutro Baths Museum. And, you know, even less was known up, up until now, really about his acquisition of the Egyptian collection that's in the Global Museum at S State. 
And so um, my colleagues and I started doing some research and we found several key records that really helped piece together how, when, and where Sutro acquired this collection. And so these are photographs from his letters to his associates that are currently in the Sutro library at SF State. Um, and um, he, he wrote these letters to his associates um, to sort of keep tabs on what was going on in, in San Francisco while he was away. And this letter dates to March of 1884. So it's March 6, 1884, and he's writing from Cairo. And he actually recounts how he had just been traveling um, in Malta, and he comments how this land of the pharaohs is very interesting. You know, he's all business, and then every now and then he sort of interjects with a comment on his travels. And the next letter from Sutro that we have after that dates to March 23rd, 1884. And it's also from, from Cairo, or he's writing from Cairo to the same associates. And he briefly details how he traveled up the Nile as far as Nubia. And he also notes spending several days amongst the ruins of ancient Thebes and that he had an altogether enjoyable trip. So, you know, that's not that much information, but really what's interesting is that this letter places Sutro in Egypt in 1884 in an area that I had kind of already suspected some of the objects from the collection originated just based on, you know, my looking at them and, and kind of understanding their style. But the key piece of evidence to really understanding this acquisition of the collection came from a publication of letters written by a man named Charles Edwin Wilbur. And during Wilbur's time, he, he spent time abroad in Egypt between 1880 and 1891. And he was an American philosopher, he was a writer, and he was also an amateur Egyptologist who had close ties to the antiquities department in Egypt. And he also acquired, he was a collector himself, and he acquired many antiquities that actually became, um, that he donated later on to the Brooklyn Museum. And in a letter dated to Saturday, March 15th, 1884, Wilbur recounts his interactions with a broad and heavy man who spoke with a German Western accent. And this man was, was Sutro, and he had come to Luxor on that specific day to bid on, quote, some of the Gebeline mummies, where you can see Gebeline here, it's just south of Luxor. Um, and we know that those mummified individuals are Nespa Paraneb and the anonymous woman who are in our collection at the museum. And this piece of information is also really important because it confirms that the, the coffins and the mummified individuals likely came from that particular region and most notably came from the site of Gebeline. Um, and also looking at uh, an analysis of the composition and style of the decoration of, of both coffins, that, that also further supports the argument that that was sort of their original context and that they come from Thebes and Gebeline, uh, respectively. So it was even more astounding, though, is that Wilbur records that Sutro astonished Luxor by buying yesterday a room of antiquities for 2,500 francs, or about 100 British pounds of Mohammed Mahasib. And that is dated to Monday, March 17th, 1884. And we know that that's when he purchased the bulk of his Egyptian collection, which was likely hundreds of objects at the time. And um, Mohammed Mahasib was an antiquities dealer. And if you sort of calculate how much that, that is, that was roughly around 6,800 US dollars. So, you know, he just dropped 6,800 US dollars at one time, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have any photographs of Mohammed Mahasib, but we know that he was a prominent antiquities dealer in Luxor from 1843 to about 1928. And he was a veteran dealer in antiquities uh, who was known to and esteemed by Egyptologists. And if you see here in blue, this is where his shop was located in Sharia el Lukanda in Luxor where all of the main antiquity shops were uh, located. And these types of stores were open for business in the winter time, which was tourist season, and they were well stocked with objects. And even though we don't have an image of what Mahasib's shop looked like specifically, here are a few images from some of the oldest antiquity shops in Egypt. This is the Kawam Brothers Antiquity Shop in Cairo. And this gives you a sense 
of the type of shop Sutro would have entered in Egypt when he bought a room of antiquities. And you know, Sutro spent a fair amount of time in Cairo. I don't have any evidence to support it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he entered these kinds of shops himself when he was in Cairo and maybe even had gone to the Kawam Brothers antiquity shop as well. But um, after Sutro's purchase of the collection and before his departure from Luxor, Sutro, his niece, and Wilbur all met and they dined together. And during these conversations, Sutro started talking about gathering the library and how he already had 40,000 volumes and he was meant to go as far as 200,000. And um, what's interesting is in his letters, Wilbur really doesn't express a very high opinion of Sutro and he remarks on these impulsive purchasing habits, which we you know, talked about already. And he mentions that Sutro, um, you know, Sutro was kind of this impulsive man who was just buying everything up. Um, but also Wilbur mentions that Sutro took those purchases back to Cairo and then they were shipped back to San Francisco. And we know from newspaper articles from the San Francisco Morning Call, which reported in August of 1885, that um, the collection, along with the mummified individuals, arrived in San Francisco. And the newspaper article actually closes with a really interesting line that notes the final destination of the objects is actually unknown. And it says, but there's a general feeling that the city will one day be enriched by a valuable library and magnificent museum being the generous gift of Adolf Sutro. So then once that collection arrived in San Francisco, we know that it was housed for about 10 years in Sutro's personal library at 107 Battery Street from you know, about 1885 to 1895. And then it was transferred to the Sutro baths where it was put on display from 1895 until 1966. That's a long time to be on display. Um, and then around that time, Professor Becker Colonna from the Classics Department at SF State negotiated with the Sutro Baths Corporation to have the collection transferred to the basement of the UC Extension campus, where she also taught, um, just because SF State didn't have the space uh, at the time of the transfer. And it wasn't until the fall of 1972 that the collection was brought to the Classics Department at SF State where students began studying it and curating it and uh, um, taking care of the collection. And then in the spring of 1979, some of the objects, including the mummified individuals, were featured in a student curated show that was in Macy's in Union Square. And eventually, the collection was used to establish the Museum Studies Master's Program in 1987 and has been under the stewardship of the program ever since. So now that you have a better understanding of the history, let's look at the research that our faculty, staff, and students are conducting on the Egyptian collection. So in their classes, students really have been closely studying, registering, photographing, and entering these objects into digital databases that Christine Fogarty already mentioned. Here's another link to it because we highly encourage you to look at it because the purpose of this is to make it accessible to the broader public. Um, students in my classes and also with Christine have been creating educational curriculum projects for grade school field trips um, that really address stereotypes about ancient Egypt that focus on not othering or exoticizing ancient Egyptian culture and are really trying to foster meaningful and personalized learning experiences for our visitors. And lastly, Student research on the collection and application of new technologies has really helped us create fun, exciting, and engaging learning tools for virtual visitors and future in-person visitors too. So um, our recent collaboration with UC Berkeley's Book of the Dead and 3D project has allowed us to apply photogrammetry visualizing techniques to study several of the objects in the collection. And really by doing this, we are able to create 3D models that allow the visitor to manipulate the object and to see details and inscriptions that maybe we wouldn't necessarily get to see that clearly with the naked eye. And so here you can see um, on the top right, some of our students are learning from a UC Berkeley researcher and graduate student, Kia Johnson, how to take images of uh, one of the boxes, the Shabti boxes that you'll learn more about. 
Um, below, you see our students preparing some of the objects. And the one that you see here sort of being rotated around um, clumsily by me because I can't manage my mouse very well is actually an early dynastic period tall cylindrical vessel and this this vessel dates to approximately 3100 to 2600 bc that's about 4500 years old that is that that is amazing um and this uh 3d model allowed us to really clearly see this unique incised figure of an inverted bird that you can see here a little bit more clearly um and so the the vessel the decoration we get to see something a little bit more clearly it's lovely it's exceptional and it reveals a little bit more to the modern viewer that you wouldn't necessarily get to see or manipulate this 4,500 year old vessel on your own. And so let's take a closer look then at the coffins of the individual named Nespa Perineb. And he was buried with uh, two wooden coffins and one cartonnage case that's made of linen, plaster, and paint. So essentially he has three coffins and we call it a triple nested coffin. And you can see here that the mummy, uh, the mummified body was placed inside this cartonnage case, and then it was nested inside the other two like Russian nesting dolls. And we're currently working on a model that nests all three of them that you can play with and interact with in much more interesting ways. And that's, that's coming soon. But um, the inscriptions and the decoration on the coffins give us insight into who was buried in these coffins and who this person was during ancient times. So if we take a look at the middle coffin, for example, the inscription tells us that the deceased individual's name was Nes Papera Neb. And you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? That's a very long name. But his name literally translates to he who belongs to the house of gold which is a beautiful name when you understand what it, what it means, the significance. And he was a priest of Amun in the temple of Karnak, which is modern day Luxor. And so based on the style of the inscription and the style of the coffins and the decoration, we can say with some certainty that Nespa Perin Neb lived during the 22nd dynasty or sometime around 945 to 720 BCE. And his funerary inscriptions are, are fairly standard and like most ancient Egyptians during that time, and I would say even modern day <laughs> individuals, he wished for life, prosperity, and health, which you can see here, the hieroglyphs, that translates to Ankweja Seneb, so life, prosperity, and health. And you can see the hieroglyphs here on his coffin, and this is uh, the, the translation in the, or the transliteration in the translation here. And the scenes that we see here on the decorated innermost coffin uh, present traditional Egyptian images like the winged sun disk that you see here at the top. You see the, the sun disk in the middle, the cobras and the wings, that's a protective symbol um, that represent rebirth. And then you also can clearly see a funerary boat that would have helped to safely transport the deceased into the afterlife. And you can see where it is located on the model and this sort of like blown up version of it um, that gives you a much clearer image of what that looked like. And you um, also, what's really fascinating is that in this cartonnage model, you can also get a unique glimpse of what Nespa Perineb looked like according to um, idealized Egyptian artistic conventions. So what's really fascinating and amazing about the photogrammetry model of this coffin is that we can see an image that's usually rather difficult to see in a museum setting because the image is on its side, the coffin, excuse me, is on its side, um, and it's obscured by the protective glass or the vitrine. Sometimes you can't, you just can't see it very well. You have to get down, it's, it's hard. But here we can actually see Nas Paper and Neb himself. And what he's holding here are offerings. He's dressed nicely, he's young, he's youthful. And he's walking before a group of gods um, in, in sort of, he's providing offerings and he's hoping for blessings into the afterlife. And so together, the decoration and the inscriptions give us a glimpse into the life and afterlife of this ancient individual who is named Nes Papara Neb. 
And another notable object in our collection that we've been able to study more thoroughly on account of photogrammetry um, and these 3D models is the yellow painted coffin of an anonymous woman. And again, based on the inscriptions and the decoration, we have a pretty good idea that she lived during the late 21st, uh, early 22nd dynasties. So that's around 1069 to 720 BCE. And her coffin is beautifully painted, but you can see there's a difference in the style between Nespa Paraneb's decoration and hers. And that's because she has a more provincial style that can be traced to a specific archeological site, Gebeline, um, the one that's about 40 kilometers south of Thebes. So, so Nespa Paraneb was more of a cosmopolitan man and she was more of, you know, the, the, the rural um, provincial um, person. And you can see though that her, she has a beautifully unique face and wig and her collar and they're all really delicately painted. Um, and you can see that I've also highlighted here in red two instances where dowels are actually poking through. And you might see that perhaps as a flaw, but I actually see that and a lot of people see that as something that's really fascinating because what it gives us is a better sense of how these coffins were constructed and assembled. So, you know, we see that the decoration has a unique style to it, um, but we also, it, it also has inscriptions on it as well that are uh, run, that run down here in sort of these, uh, these vertical bands. But the inscriptions, unfortunately, don't give the same level of detail and information as Nespa Paraneds are actually really repetitive and they don't give us her name, which is why she's the anonymous woman. But more research is currently being conducted on this coffin and we hope to know more about her or get a sen better sense of her, um, her beliefs for the afterlife. Um, so I encourage you, we encourage you to please check out these models and our collection database when you have more time. Um, you know, we're hoping that by making these collections more widely accessible to students and to visitors that we at SF State can present accurate historical narratives about the collection and uh, the objects and ancient Egyptians. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Hopefully you're enjoying your drink. You have some more information at your disposal about the history of the collection. And so I'm happy now to hand it over to some of the Museum Studies graduate students who are going to guide you on a tour of some of the other interesting objects that we have in the collection. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jimenez. And before we move on to the rest of the objects, there was a question from Katie who asked why Ness had so many coffins compared to the anonymous woman. Oh, well, that's a good question. So he probably had um, more coffins for a couple of reasons. One, he was probably a higher elite individual. Um, and also this was some, this was a style that was very typical of that period of time. So she predates him by a couple hundred years. So it's possible that that wasn't really something that was typical. It's also one of the reasons why it's rare that we even have this coffin set is because often they were, they were taken apart and they were sold separately. So the fact that we have one that's complete is really interesting. So she may have had another coffin. Um, often it was common to have two, um, but it's possible that that was her, her only one. So yeah, it, it boils down to um, the time period. They're, they're both separated by a few hundred years and um, uh, style and status. Thank you. And thank you, Katie. That was a really good question. Yeah, good question. Um, let me just share my screen again. And now um, Rebecca and I will be diving a little bit deeper into some other objects from the collection. So we will be looking at three themes, um, that being life, death, and spirit. As you might already know that these are very interconnected in ancient Egypt. So I will start us off with these three charming oil lamps. Um, these were originally believed to be terracotta, which is actually not a native material to Egypt. Um, they have the River Nile, so it's more likely that the clay that was used to make these lamps would come from uh, the River Nile. It's red silt clay. Um, and what's really interesting about these is that they were manufactured. So these were actually mass produced, well, according, you know, mass production in 
ancient Egypt, um, but they would have used stone molds to create multiples of these objects. And in the middle area where you see that opening, that's where they would put in different types of oil. So it could be um, sesame oil or other types of natural oils. And where you see that kind of spout, that's where a wick would have been and lit. And it's really interesting to imagine an era where you don't have overhead lighting. Um, you don't have lighting in general, so you have to carry your own light around. And what's so great about this design that we see here is compared to its um, predecessor, which would have been just a little bowl of oil with the wick on the side, this is a much safer option because the hot oil is encased um, and you're less likely to make a mess. And my favorite out of these three is the middle one with its cute three little spouts. And also you can see on the left-hand side of the object, it used to have a handle, um, which broke at one point in the object's history. Um, but that's just a really neat addition to um, the design of this handheld lamp. And moving on to our next object, I don't have it written here because I wanna see some guesses in the chat. Um, if you have worked in the Global Museum before, don't spoil it, but I wanna see what people think this object would be. Ooh. We see, wow. They are, um, I think they're like eight inches tall-ish. Um, wow, people got it right, yes. So they are pillows. Um, well, technically they are headrests. Um, so I saw one guest that said neck holder. Um, it would actually support a person's head while they are sleeping, while they're alive. So they're not for um, burial purposes, even though they would have been buried with deceased individuals. And um, there's a couple of reasons, I mean, as a, you know, as a person living in 2021 and sleeping with five pillows, I can't really imagine how this would have been comfortable. Um, but they were headrests, like they, these wooden ones or ceramic ones have been found all over the world, all over Africa, all over Asia. Um, so the main theories behind why these were used is they are more common in hotter climates. So um, lifting the individual's head off of the ground would allow for more air circulation. It could have been also for uh, pest control. So the less um, kind of organic soft materials you have in the home, the less likely you are to have pest problems. And um, especially in ancient Egypt, but also in other parts of the world, uh, it could protect your hair. So one really great example of other cultures having um, headrests such as these ones for hair protection um, purposes would be China in the Ming Dynasty and also geishas in Japan. Um, I might mess it up, but I believe those were called um, takamakura. So it's not, it's not necessarily unique to ancient Egypt, but they are really fantastic objects to just look at and think about how they would have been used. Um, and speaking of beauty products, um, this is probably one of my favorite objects within our, well not our collection, but the collection that we steward. This is a bronze mirror. Um, and first of all, it's just fascinating to think about that a person would have held this in their hand um, 3,000 years ago and see their reflection. Um, that's, I don't know, it's just a beautiful thought for me. And we actually have this um, fragment from the Getty with a person applying makeup. So we can really imagine them applying their eyeliner or rouge or just, just fixing their wig um, while holding this mirror. And the there's a couple of things that we can observe here. Um, it's, it's round. So the round shape symbolizes the sun, symbolizing the sun, uh, the life, beauty, um, and also the wooden handle, which is just a simplified lotus shape. Um, that is also a symbol of beauty, regeneration, and rebirth as the lotus flower closes at night and then opens back up again in the morning. 
Um, so even though it's quite a simple everyday object, it is very deeply ingrained with symbolism. And in this next slide, we see um, the two sides of the mirror. And what's interesting about this object right now is um, throughout its history, one side has been polished in the Global Museum um, to research into what it could have looked like back in the day. So that's the top image that you see there um, with the reflection of the hand, which is eerie and beautiful in its own way. And then on the bottom one, you see um, the corrosion that has happened overnight on the bronze. And this object actually has bronze disease, which is, a, is quite a common metal corrosion that occurs um, to objects over time. So what students in the Global Museum have done, they created specific uh, casings for this object. So it can be quarantined away from the rest of the collection um, to really maintain its integrity for as long as we can possibly um, have that. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca who will talk a little bit more about some other objects. Hello everyone, I am here to talk to you about our next theme, which is death, here to bring you some fun facts about some funerary objects for your pleasure. So our first object here is a wood fragment depicting Anubis. Um, it's kind of hard to get a feel of how big the object is. It's actually pretty small. It's only about three and a half inches in height and five and a half inches wide. And so as you can see depicted here is Anubis, who is the Egyptian god of mummification and the afterlife, who guided the deceased in the next world. He is typically depicted as a black canine or a jackal dog hybrid with pointed ears. And correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Jimenez, but I looked up, I was looking up why he was like depicted in black and I found diff two different sources. One depicting, saying that he was depicted in black because of like it represented death, but then another source saying that black represented the fertile soil of the Nile and because they needed to grow like yearly crops and that it symbolizes good fortune and rebirth. So I wasn't sure which was correct. So I thought I would ask. Pretty much all of the above. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, that's not wrong. It's it's pretty much everything because every, uh, there was so much symbolism that was pulled from, you know, what they experienced in their life from the Nile and then, you know, additional symbolism of, you know, like association. So yeah, it's all, it's all correct. Awesome. I was very confused. I was like, I don't know what's correct. So I'll just ask the question anyways. So, and next up we have our, can you go to the next slide for me? There we go, there we go. We have the canopic jar lid. So this is used in the mummification process, which began with the removal of the internal organs. And then the embalmers was used special containers called the canopic jars to separately preserve the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines. And each jar actually represented the four sons of Horus, which Agnes will get to talk to you a little bit more about that in the next section with in detailed and our attempt at proper pronunciation of Egyptian names. Um, and they're the deities who would protect the organs when during the mummification process. And this jar represents Im Imseti, the human headed deity who protects the liver. And it's actually made out of limestone. And so I don't have a lot of knowledge about canopic jars. Mainly my knowledge comes from a fourth grade interpretation of the mummification process that I got to witness, which is kind of jarring as an 11 year old, but it was fascinating at the same time. So I think this is a pretty cool object. As you can see, it's a, it has a few like cracks and whatnot, but it's, it's pretty cool and I kind of enjoy it. So next we have our Shopti box, which the detailing on, can I just say the detailing on this object, I think is fascinating, especially with the fact that it's held up for so long. And so the Shoptis were small figures that were depicting mummified individuals that were meant to accompany the deceased into the afterlife. And they were finely decorated wooden boxes that depict takes the individual when they're arriving at Osiris and Isis with an offering in front of him. And they're surrounded by the sons of Horus because they're protective spirits of the dead. So on top, you can see there are three curved lids with knobs opening to the three compartments separated by loose dividers. And the paintings on the sides are, are the deceased standing, uh, 
standing by in front of Osiris and kneeling seated next to Horus. And then it also has the name of our deceased. It says the Osiris of the stable of the house of Amun Taka, true of voice. And so the inscription true of voice, it basically is just saying that everything the deceased says is true and that the deceased is free to pass into the afterlife, which I think is beautiful. And then up next, we have our Ushapti figures. Almost said boxes. That's not correct. Ushapti figures. So they're small funerary figures that have been found inside linen wrappings that are arranged around the body or throughout the inside of tombs. The spells inscribed on these figures ordered them to perform manual tasks in the afterlife on behalf of of the deceased. So some individuals were buried with hundreds of Ushaptis, and the figures with the same name may have belonged to one owner and come from the same tomb. They're only about five centimeters, two inches tall, and they're, it's honestly super cool how many like mysteries they hold. So the material that they're made out of is feinance. Connect my pronunciation. Um, it's a type of material that we will be frequently encountering tonight. Um, the term most commonly refers to tin glaze, to a tin glaze pottery technique originating from Italy in the Middle Ages. However, in Egyptian context, it refers to a different process. So instead of clay, uh, crushed quartz, alkalines, and other materials were mixed into the paste, and beads and statuettes were formed by hand mold, mold, molding or produced clay molds. And their bright colors are results of chemical reactions from metal oxidides within the paste, such as copper, which results in a striking turquoise color. And this is often called a self-glazing ceramic, meaning that the salts within the paste rise to the surface of the shaped object while drying and turn into a glaze while firing them. So they're super beautiful. And it's hard to see all the detailing on them, but like you can see the, the carvings on them. So we have quite a few in our collection. Up next, we have the Ushapti of Amenemopa. Amenemopa. And this is just a similar collection to the other Ushaptis that we have in our collection as well. So next, we have, I think the ne our next object is my favorite object, just because of all the tiny people on it. This is a funerary boat, and it's a tomb offering meant to aid the deceased into the afterlife and help them on their journey down the river Nile after death. Um, these boat models only occur in the Middle Kingdom in burials. And they're quite labor intensive, so afterwards they're more widely depicted on paintings on tombs. And the sails and details are accurate on this to how a funerary boat would have actually looked. Um, very rarely the remains of these funeral bolts are actually found and these statues and um, smaller figurines are more commonly preserved and unearthed. So next we have Agnes is going to talk to you a little bit more about our theme of spirit. So thank you for bearing with me through all my terrible pronunciations. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. I think I might be using just the Hungarian pronunciation, but I believe it's Fayens. So if any other pottery nerds are here with us tonight, I loved looking into this because um, the objects that we see right now are actually also Fayens. So it's, it's really interesting to see um, a glazing that doesn't come from later application. So usually you would, you know, fire an object and then glaze it and then fire it again. And then the chemicals come up with all sorts of brilliant colors. And here instead, we have all these um, chemicals just raising to the surface and doing it all on their own. So that's just really fascinating to me. So right now we are on to the last three groups of objects of our tour tonight uh, within our spiritual category. So we have two amulets on screen right now, a sacred scarab and an eye of Horus. So um, again, the sizing might be tricky on your screens. The eye of Horus is actually only one inch tall and two inches wide. So it's a lot smaller in person. Um, but the scarab that we see here is around five and a half inches wide and was actually um, buried with Ness. So that's how it made its way to the collection. Um, and so scarabs as a motif, and I, the Eye of Horus too, they are still incredibly popular today. 
Um, and they were both used for protection, both in life and in the afterlife. So the eye of Horus, according to the myth, um, Horus's right eye was the sun, which represented power, and his left eye was the moon, which um, battling with another deity, Seth, he lost his left eye. But Hathor, who is the goddess of the sky, had restored the eye, which then became a symbol of healing and regeneration. So it's really no wonder that the symbol itself became a protective symbol um, throughout the population, both in life and in death. Um, so this amulet would have commonly been placed within the wrappings of a mummy um, to help them safely pass into the afterlife. And the scarabs, um, and I'm blown away by this, but basically the scarab, the hieroglyph, um, it can refer to the DT Kepri, um, who was in charge of making the sun rise in the morning. Kepri would roll the sun, the disk of the sun up as it was rising in the morning uh, over the horizon. And apparently there's um, the, the symbolism of this rolling motion and the scarab rolling, well, really dung on the ground, it resonated so much that they became intertwined as symbols. And the hieroglyph itself is also used for higher concepts like manifestation or existence or growth. Um, and they were really just uh, popular uh, protective symbols. Um, not to be confused with what we see in movies today where there are these horrible flesh eating insects coming for you. Um, so they're good, they're good. Um, and this is just a really beautiful piece. Um, more science beauties. Um, these are amulets depicting the sons of Horus. Um, and I'm actually gonna hop over, well, to the next slide, but not just yet. So um, Rebecca has already talked about how they would have been the protectors of the internal organs of the deceased after the embalming process. Um, so here we see Imsadi, the human um, son of Horus, the human faced figure, and also Hapi on the left, who is the baboon. Um, Imsati would have been in charge of protecting the liver, and Hapi is the protector of lungs. And what's really interesting about this set of amulets in particular is that they have been strung as necklaces. Now, um, for especially for museum study students, this is really interesting because um, can anyone see any issues with hanging a necklace like this? I'm gonna take a peek at the chat. Um, we can see two holes drilled into the amulet and they are hung as necklaces and we have a pretty good idea that they would never have been worn like this in ancient Egypt. Okay, I'm gonna point it out. Um, the necklace has been restrung by a merchant most likely because we can see that they're hung by their feet. We don't wanna hang a deity upside down. That's first of all, incredibly disrespectful. And also then they wouldn't be able to exercise their protective powers over you. So what we believe has happened here is that these beads, which are also faience, would have been found along with the mummified individuals and alongside the amulets themselves, but with the fiber that was holding them together as kind of um, attached both on top and on the bottom of the amulet the fiber would have disintegrated. So whoever has acquired the beads and the amulets kind of fabricated these necklaces that would never have existed as an object. Um, so here are their two brothers, um, Kebe Senue and Duamutef. Thank you, Professor Jimenez for the nod. Um, so here in the right, we can actually see the jackal-headed figure of Duamatuf um, hung right side up, which is reassuring. Um, but again, these amulets would have been um, applied to the mummies with uh, the beads coming both from their head and their feet um, rather than as necklaces. So 
And just to finish the list, um, Demuthev, the jackal figure, would have been the protector of the stomach. And then Kevin Seneth, the hawk figure, would have been the protector of the intestines. Um, and on to our last object of the evening, this statue of Osiris from the late period. Um, the full name of the statue would actually have been Ta Sokara Osiris. In the late period, um, provincial art was more common as it was less controlled by well, the, the kingdom, the government. So oftentimes um, areas and regions would find their own protective deities. Um, and this statue is an example of that. So here we see Osiris, um, who is a god of fertility and agriculture and resurrection with his crown, um, which features two ostrich plumes and a disc, a sun disc in the middle and two horns on the side. And you can kind of see on the left image here that the right horn has either in the 90s or the early 2000s, it has been um, repaired with an acrylic. Um, so that's an interesting thing to note about the object's history. So it would have been found with the horn broken and then later on it was repaired. And for the first time, this is actually bigger than it looks on the screen. This is 22 inches of bronze, which is actually quite big for such an object. Um, and that is our last object in our tour. Thank you, thank you for bearing with me. Um, and I've seen a lot of questions come in. So I think Nicole is gonna take us to Q&A. Is that right? Yes, I absolutely am. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Lisa. You guys, uh, Rebecca, so amazing. Um, John and I had nothing to add. You were, you were so incredible. We just stuck to the chat. Um, so, okay, let's see what questions we've got. We've got a handful here. Let's go from the bottom up. We've got, how close is this color to the original appearance of the fans? Fans? It's actually what it would have looked like and maybe even a little duller than what it, what it would have been. It's, it's a glass composite material. So it would have been vibrant and really shiny and beautiful. Um, so it's been worn, some of these pieces have been worn, worn down a little bit. And some of them you can see still have very sort of shiny elements to them too. Whoops, sorry. My cat is writing in the chat right now. It's been all up in my business. <laughs> sorry, <definitely>. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> question mark? What are you wondering? <laughs> I had a question. Please. <laughs> oh, sorry, Agnes. I had a question based on um, something you said earlier about bronze disease. Um, what do you do? This is for my museum nerds in the audience. What do you do when an object it has some sort of condition like that? How do you preserve it? How do you keep it safe from the rest of the collection? No one wants to answer? <laughs> I can jump in just practically. <laughs> I don't understand the science of it, but what we do is isolate it within its own container. So um, I think Agnes and Rebecca might have mentioned that uh, that we created some ether foam um, lined uh, plastic cases, and we just isolate them and, and put them basically in a quarantine section. And we have quite a few objects like that. So because we think that they it transfers when they're close to each other, so we just isolate. Them. Right. We've got so many comments in the chat, too. So I know we I know we've got a museum nerd crowd here. Welcome, everyone. Um, OK, Anne had a really interesting question. She said there's your collection and there's the Egyptian Museum in San Jose. Where else in California are there substantial Egyptian collections? Also, should we be sending them back to Egypt like our historians in Egypt anxious to have these come back to the country? What are the ethics around this subject? Oh, I can tackle tackle some of that one. <clears throat> so yes, there is another very large collection that's housed in the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology that's at UC Berkeley. That's actually the largest collection of Egyptian objects west of Chicago. So um, right here in the Bay Area. And um, in terms of should we be sending them back to Egypt, that's something that we're all talking about and discussing, um, which is why understanding the history of your collection is really important. I can't speak 
to the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose because I don't really know much about the history of that collection. But I can speak to the Hearst Museum's collection, and that was collected mostly during excavations by George Reisner in the early 1900s that were, um, that were um, financed by Phoebe Hearst. So everything that came to the Hearst Museum by Reisner was a part of um, what's known as partage. So half went to the excavator and the sponsoring institution and half stayed in Egypt. Um, and you know, our collection was purchased in a period where there were no laws in place. So it was technically legal for Sutro to bring these objects to San Francisco. So because legally the collections are, are, are sort of safe. Um, you know, we, we're still thinking about ethically, you know, it should, should we have them should be return should should they be returned, you know, we're still thinking about that and, and open to discussions, especially if community um, members and stakeholders um, request these objects to be returned. I think that's, you know, I don't know if anybody has anything else to, to contribute to that. I'm all for our discussions, um, you know, and, and I think it's important to, to consider, consider um, everything. Lisa, this is why you're mindful of saying that you steward the collection right now, that you don't own it, that you can't own objects like this. It's part of a larger um, coming to terms with how we collect and keep things. Yes, and I see Professor Luby posted, this is 21st century museum practice to discuss, <laughs> right? It's to, to think through everything, um, to, to think about, you know, what, what is um, best for, for best museum practice. Um, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And maybe John, you can jump in here along with Lisette um, or the rest of our museum studies crowd here. Can anyone contextualize Sutro's collection within the broader world of classical collecting during the Gilded Age in America? And maybe John, you can speak to um, Sutro's collecting habits even outside of this specific facet of his collection. Maybe it's kind of a, a homely simile, but you're, you're seeing uh, some uh, tech rich people today looking to get involved with research projects. Um, uh, Bill Gates uh, was on 60 Minutes uh, talking about alternative energies and conservation. Uh, in a way, that's what uh, Adolf Sutro and some of his ilk were doing is they thought they were doing good by collecting these things. Um, his library collecting was to create a museum or rather a, a library of practical knowledge not necessarily just you know old books, but things science, research, uh, history, uh, where scholars could use them. The idea of his collecting the Egyptian, and uh, he also collected, like in the photograph here, uh, mummified uh, mummified <laughs> taxidermy specimens, um, gemstones, put them on display, and the uh, basically the blue collar working class uh, San Franciscans they could come and be educated. They could be exposed to culture. People didn't travel in those days. Uh, that's why this, this was education. And uh, Sutro was sort of the uh, penultimate example of that you can do um, well by doing good. And he really was the, the noblesse oblige. Uh, I think quite a few people were like, look at, look at what um, the, uh, Carnegie did funding uh, libraries. So while well, we just think of these people as, as Americans or Europeans on the grand tour buying everything in sight, at least someone like Sutro had altruistic desires too. Although it was also something you could slap his name on and even better known than he was. <laughs> he did like to name things after himself. Mount yeah, Sutro, exactly. maybe you're familiar with. Sutro Baz, obviously. Sutro mm -hmm. Tower. No, uh, he didn't name Sutro Tower. Oh, shoot. That was a little bit later. He was yeah, already dead a few years. <laughs> yeah, originally, he was made a wicker. And uh, was... <laughs> Lisette, yeah, I, I ran with that one. I, I'd love to hear your perspective because you're the real, you know, museum Egyptologist. No, oh, I think I think you're you're you know right on the money basically in terms of characterizing what was going on during this time. And I can speak more to the to the wealthy, you know, American and Europeans who were collecting in Egypt at this time, and they were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to create 
their own collections, their personal collections to study it, to try to publish it, to try to decipher the hieroglyphs, to try to understand all of this, this stuff and to gain prominence and notoriety and also to, to help you know, funnel their collections and their, their names to, to museums as well. You, know, you have the Metropolitan Museum, the MFA Boston, um, you know, all of these, all of these other institutions, prominent institutions, it was all under this, you know, they, they were trying to, you know, their, their motives were to try to preserve a culture that they thought was not being properly preserved, which is incorrect, obviously, you know, they were buying it up and they were trying to create their own collections uh, to educate everybody else who couldn't travel to Egypt, but also to elevate their status as as well so it was yeah <laughs> there's a, there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> <laughs> i mean that was the whole point of these all these classical museums that we're used to going into i keep thinking of um the main museum uh in philadelphia that big you know museum up on a hill that is it the museum the philadelphia museum of art is that what it's called i think where there's like I don't, like armor on display next to woven tapestries next to bows and arrows next to archaeological dig artifacts this cabinet of curiosities vibe to museums which all of our museum studies folks know intimately um that was part of the same process of being of collecting from all over the world and bringing it here bringing it to your city for the prestige of it but also so that people had access to it in ways they couldn't if they couldn't go and travel. And our de Young Museum actually began in that kind of format. It came out of the 1894 Midwinter Fair that um, Sutro went and collected from, um, unabashedly I think is the proper term there. Um, and that's what you could find on display, Napoleonic era artifacts and um, woven baskets and gems and minerals, things like that. It was not the fine arts museum that we're, that we're used to today. Oh, now people are hating on the de Young. That's not what I wanted to start. <laughs> <laughs> not what I wanted to trigger. Um, we do have another question from one of our uh, attendees from Ben. This goes way back to the beginning. So thanks for waiting, Ben. Do Egyptian foods originate from Europe? <laughs> Stump, stumped all the panelists. <laughs> oh, too bad Lindsay's not here. Goose, goose. Um, I can't, I, I can say that there are some modern day Egyptian foods that obviously originate from Europe, but I, I, I mean, I'm sure that there were some things that were certainly brought over by, by the Greeks during, you know, a variety of periods. I, I'm not a food expert, so I can't say, I'm sorry. Well, that just means that there's more space for research, but I mean, also they had really robust farming and really great agriculture in Egypt even at that time. So I would assume that the majority of what they had um, would have come from their own region, right? Think so? <laughs> we'll have to look into that and get back to you, everyone. Um, oh gosh, now there's some more questions coming in. Okay, Rick wants to know, and I, Martini, I think this is a, um, a question for you. Is there what? still the stuffed birds and other dead things um, from the aviary at Woodward's Gardens. Yes. What about them? Where are they? <laughs> are they still around? Do they still live? Uh, they're, um, most of the stuffed specimens that uh, Sutra had purchased were uh, really in harm's way by the 1950s when the uh, Sutro's descendants sold Sutro baths. Uh, to a group called the Whitney's. The Whitney's, they own Playland at the beach and they own the Cliff House. And they operated Sutro's from uh, late 1952 till it closed, 1966. And uh, one of the first things they did was they cleaned house of these really bad taxidermied items. If anyone's ever dealt with 19th century taxidermy items, they're, uh, the stuffing usually involves arsenic, among other things. And they get, um, they get all kinds of rot, uh, disease 
And th there's a photograph, very famous one, that shows a truck being loaded up with stuffed animals outside Sutro's that was headed for a landfill somewhere down near, near Pacifica. Um, in the collection of GGNRA, Nicole, you might remember this, the, the leaky sea lion, uh, the, we keep it wrapped in plastic because it was leaking some terrible yellow sawdust. Everyone was terrified of it. Yes. Apparently the uh, uh, guy who was hauling away the stuffed animals, people were coming up and, and offering to buy these things from him. So a few of them apparently did survive. Like we have one that's reportedly in the baths, the rest uh, landfill. What apparently they kept behind when they uh, took over Sutro's was uh, the Egyptian collection. Uh, some of the, the uh, there's a big collection of uh, geodes and crystals, uh, of course, which are inert. They weren't gonna hurt anything. Um, my impression is some of the stuffed birds may have survived. There seem to be an awful lot of stuffed birds, but um, the vast, vast majority was uh, that was on display in those photographs in the 50s and 60s. It was stuff that uh, the Whitney's brought in. They were they were as weird collectors as was Adolf. They 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 were kindred spirits. I had often wondered too. I started wondering about the origin of the De Young Museum or, or the concept of a museum like that in San Francisco, which predated the 1894 Midwinter Fair. And for a time, they had taken a large amount of. Uh, specimen stuffed birds and things from a private collector and they stashed it in the children's uh, playground um, the Sharon or the Sharon art building is today they stashed it in the basement there and they had turned that into like this weird like makeshift museum uh, for a little bit and it descriptions in newspapers sound incredibly creepy because it's mostly just these birds in this super dark basement area that would terrify local <laughs> children um, <laughs> You know, it's important. Exhibition display is important, right? Like you got to get it right or else it's, it can be terrifying. Um, yeah. So, okay. yeah, we, we have some of the uh, uh, logs kept by the uh, Sutro's, uh, I guess it's called facility engineer when the baths opened mm -hmm. and uh, that big glass building leaked all over the place. They had at one time two taxidermists on uh, staff just to maintain the collection. And they talked about that when it rained, they used to have to cover uh, a lot of the specimens with tarps because they were getting wet. Um, this is, I, I'm actually surprised that the Egyptian collection is in as good a condition it is considering where it was. There was no climate control. There was no HVAC. No one thought of that stuff. It's true. Well, I mean, that's a testament to um, what great stewards San Francisco State has been since the Oh, 70s. yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question from one of our audience members. Do any of the artifacts or inscriptions describe Egyptian music of the time? I don't think any of the objects in our collection specifically describe Egyptian music. Um, I, we, we, we don't necessarily know how much or how it sounded like. Um, there are people who specifically study it and have tried to recreate it using different kinds of instruments. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sure it was lovely. They had beautiful instruments, flutes, sort of harps, you know, beautiful, beautiful instruments. Again, outside of my area of expertise, but that is a good question. So um, we have some John Martini fans in the crowd. Um, they wanna hear about your personal experiences of the collection in Sutro Baths. Uh what you gotta remember it was overload when you were uh, a young kid going in probably my first visits and there was four or five um there was just so much stuff uh I, I alluded to in one of the responses there was a, a collection of items that was owned by tom thumb there was samurai armor uh, there were still cases of birds there were spinning wheels there were mannequins of people in glass cases uh one of a fellow named Ito, who apparently carved a life-size figure of himself from wood, and even supposedly plucking the hair from his head. Um, there was a horrible waxwork, the Lord's Last Supper. And in amongst all these things, there was this incredible collection of uh, Egyptian artifacts, including, you know, mummified people. Um, I remember staring into the cases, and Lisette and I had a sidebar discussion on this, is they had several small 
mummies that were identified apparently as, uh, from my memory, as mummified cats. And turns out they weren't. You know, they were what mummified snake and a mummified ibis were in there. Uh, that fascinated me because you know we had cats. Um, the looking, uh, I remembered um, Nez. I'll call him that. I believe that his multiple coffins were stacked to show that it was like a, the, a nested Russian doll. And uh, if my memory is correct, and sometimes it, it fades in and out, but I believe that you could see him um, in his wrappings with the innermost coffin open. Um, he was surrounded by the other smaller objects, the boat, the uh, canopic jars, uh, the scarabs, and also, um, I, I guess, that collection, that room that Sutro bought, it also had uh, uh, disembodied body parts. Um, I remember disembodied foot, disembodied hands. It's, of course, it's the macabre that you know, really attracts your attention when you're, when you're very young. But you know, th then my attention went on to something else. You got to remember at that time, too, the, uh, the de Young was a regular haunt for all city kids, and the de Young had uh, uh, a mummified person on display. So it wasn't like it was the first time I'd ever seen it. W what did I relate it to? Hollywood movies, of course. Um, yeah, uh, Land of the Pharaohs, you know, accurate in every detail. Uh, but, but like I said, uh, Sutro's stated intent was to inspire uh, uh, curiosity and uh, search for knowledge in, in the viewers. And like I said, it worked. And uh, we have a couple of folks have also pointed out that San Francisco City Guides, which if you don't know San Francisco City Guides, they're amazing. They lead walking tours throughout the city. Right now, obviously, they're virtual walking tours, but they're doing one on um, on the Heights, uh, if I read this correctly. Oh, sorry, Land's End, pardon me. Uh, it's on February 27th at 10 a.m. And they're wonderful. I can highly recommend them. Um, let's see if we have any other questions up in here. Let me check the document. I think we've answered all the questions. Is there anything else you're dying to ask our expert panel? I don't think there are. Well, thank you everybody. This was an incredible evening of information sharing, which is what we're all about, right? Um, I mean, I know getting Lisette and John in the same room together, they discovered all kinds of things. Uh, we discovered John wanted to be an archeologist and that never happened, which is, I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life. And, <laughs> and um, we discovered so many amazing things about the Egyptian collection from Lisette and all the amazing students who have put in hours of work on this program. Let's have a round of applause figuratively. I was, I was a professional interpreter for 25 years for the Park Service, and I'm in awe of what you guys put on tonight. This was just wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, bravo. Absolutely, yes, bravo. And we do have to point out that, um, you know, both of our organizations, uh, money doesn't grow on trees. So we're gonna be dropping some links into the chat right now. Um, I'll speak for WNP and then we can have representatives of the Global Museum speak for themselves, but we are a 501c3 nonprofit and so all of your donations are tax deductible. You can become a member of Western Neighborhoods Project. How about that? You get an awesome quarterly membership magazine and then you support all the work that we're doing. Um, and the Global Museum can take it from here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And well, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Uh, I see some of our links popping up in the chat. Thank you, Frank. Um, yes, you can support the Global Museum by donating or maybe hopefully if we ever get there volunteering, <laughs> maybe in the future. Um, and also I have to highlight your membership at WMP. You just launched a student membership. So that's for all my SFSU cohort. Make sure that you check that out because uh, the Western Neighborhood Project, they do wonderful work. 
Um, and also don't forget to click on that demographic form that we have. You will also get a bonus cocktail recipe that we didn't feature tonight. <laughs> um, so, you know, maybe, maybe for Friday, maybe for the weekend. Um, I also have to thank Professor Jimenez for her wonderful expertise and guidance on this, and Christine Fogarty and Gina Caprari, who is the registrar of the Global Museum, for all your support in bringing this event to life. Um, special shout out to Karen Kinzel, Professor Kinzel. I don't know if you're here tonight, but this event grew from her class last semester. So, you know, one day you're doing uh, class project and another day you're talking to 80 strangers on the internet so you know that's that's just how we do things around here um, and thank you to Rebecca, Lindsay, Andrew, Frank and Sophie for all your amazing work um, that brought this event to life tonight so yeah cheers everyone and if you're wondering if the museum studies field is small, it is. I also work with Karen outside of this for the California Association of Museums. So, you know, always be nice to everybody you meet. You never know when they're going to pop up again. Yes. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, the Global Museum. Thank you to San Francisco State and the Museum Studies Department. We'll let you let yourselves out. Um, definitely <laughs> check us out, become members, donate to the Global Museum all that jazz um oh and i see eva in the chat thank you eva for doing our social media for the global museum and the museum studies student association yes great post <laughs> this has been wonderful i will also be sending a follow-up email that will have um a copy of the chat and also um a link to our video recording since it was not on facebook live and um and and a, another link to our uh survey which we do hope that you will fill out for us all right that's actually it now we're really gonna wave goodbye let yourselves out thank you hi good night you don't want to hear me sing the alvita zane song from <laughs> <laughs> That was great. <laughs> an equivalent of bars playing horrible music at the end of the night when they just want patrons out. <laughs> like Journey. Oh my gosh. Should we stop? The <laughs> Journey. At the at the Fillmore, Bill Graham used to play uh, church music to uh, at the end of the last set. That got everybody out. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Oh boy, green yeah. Sleeves. Oh, green sleeves. Don, our week is not over. <laughs> I know, I know. To, the, uh, I'm gonna have to rehearse my, my to keep the seven minutes. I got. Yeah, That's okay. Keep it moving. We're talking about our Fort Point event tomorrow, which sold 200 tickets. Wow! <laughs> oh my God. Boy. That's exciting. They just kept upping the the amount. Um, but yeah, don't worry, John, mine's not clocking in at, at a full eight. So you can take one of my minutes. <laughs> Just add beer. Yes, I was going to say people do love getting booze delivered to their door. Mm -hmm. For sure. Cold and under 30 minutes. I don't know what their fulfillment system is like, but it's much better than our merchandise fulfillment system. I can tell you that right now. Which is what David on his bicycle yeah it is it's one person on their bicycle all right those attendees who are still here we love you but we are going to kick you out now <laughs> if i can figure out how to do this <laughs> which thank you for coming though yes thank, thank you, you so, so much. much and i'm glad you're being here laura ackley lovely to see see you tonight laura ackley is a incredible author who wrote the book on the panama pacific international exposition laura i refer it you all the time she is the walking oracle on the, the PPIE. Yeah, she's um, amazing. But we're going to kick you out now, Laura. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't figure out how to do that. <laughs> Remove. Bye, bye, Nicole. Bye. Remove. 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 Yeah. Now I'm just kicking you all out. I'm removing you all. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. It's been lovely to have you all, but I, I am literally removing you one by one now. Okay. Remove. 
I'm also going to stop.